Okay, Shavua Tov, everyone. Well, let's start with some good news. Mazel Tov to Avril Gatov on the birth of a grandson. Mazel Tov. Um, Mazel Tov, Avril. She's not Tov. here, but she'll be listening at some point, I'm sure, to the recording. So we wish Avril Mazel Tov. Not sure yeah. exactly when the bris is going to be, um, but uh, that's uh, <laughs> something nice to start with. Just wish Mazel Tov to Avril. All right, thanks. Right, let's um, go to Shmuel Aleph. Let's just mute everybody. Right, okay, first of all, I can see Julian's joined us. How nice. Hello, Julian. Welcome to our uh, Sunday morning, Shio. Uh, it's very nice to see your name, even if we can't see your face. Um, uh, so um, you're, you're very welcome. Um, right. Let's go to Shmuel Aleph. I shall put it straight up on the screen. We are in chapter 20. We're going to finish chapter 20 today and probably start chapter 21. Because uh, what we're going to see um, in this chapter, in this shiur, is we're going to finish off the story that we're familiar with. And then we're going to start a new story, which is a continuation of this story which most of us, I think, probably will not be so familiar with. We're familiar with this story of chapter 20 because of the story of David and Jonathan, which is, of course, the Haftarah of Machar Chodesh, which we did a, a, a few weeks ago. Um, and where did we leave it? We left it um, that over here. Shaul has noticed. Oh, look, Faye's here. Let's end, let Faye in. Uh, from America, I think. Are you still in America, Faye? No, oh, she's just connecting. Okay, so um, Shaul has noticed that David is missing, and he said, where is he? And Jonathan told uh, uh, his father, not truthfully, that David asked leave of me in verse 28, um, and he says, I've got to go and uh, let me go because we've got to have a family, we're having a family meal. And this is where we, we left it, that we did the end of uh, last week. Verse 30, Jeffrey, please. You're mute. You're still, there you go. Okay. Saul's anger flared up at Jonathan, and he said to him, son of, a, son of a pervertedly rebellious woman, do I not know that you chose the son of Jesse to your own shame and the shame of your mother's nakedness? For all the days that the son of Jesse is alive on the earth, you and your kingdom will not be established. And now send and bring him to me, for he is deserving of death. OK, let's stop there. That's what we did at the end of last week. We spoke about the idea that um, Shaul was, was um, speaking disparagingly about David by calling him the Benny Shai. And the shame and the shame of your mother's nakedness. We spoke about that at the end of last week. And we said that this was a terrible thing to say to Jonathan that he was, um, uh, he, he was so ashamed of him. Uh, David uh, uh, Marx told us the, a, a lovely explanation from Rabbi Irving Jacobs um, that um, Shaw was saying that you're, you're such a rotten son. I can't imagine that you must be my son. Your mother must have um, sired you from another uh, uh, a man. Uh, you can't possibly be my son. Um, Johnny Halpin said, yes, that, that, that this, this, there was nothing more shameful than a, 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 a somebody seeing their mother's nakedness. And, and it was, uh, Shaul was, as it were, scrabbling around his mind for the most awful things that he could possibly say uh, against his son, Jonathan. Um, and, and then he says this verse 31, which I was thinking about this morning as I was preparing that actually verse 31 doesn't um, follow from verse 30. What does he say? And it also doesn't follow actually from David Marx's uh, explanation. Um, 
Because if we say in verse 30 that Shaul is absolutely um, mad as Jonathan and he says, you can't even be my son, you're, you're so revolting and so uh, um, uh, uh, you've done such a terrible thing that you're, you're choosing uh, this, this Ben Yishai over your loyalty to me. Um, um, you're, you're no son of mine, as it were. And then he says in verse 31, and you do realize, don't you, you idiot, that whilst Ben Yishai is alive, you and your kingdom will not be established. Well, if he, uh, and then he says, so go and bring him here and I'm going to kill him. Meaning that actually, what does Shaul really want? He wants Jonathan to take over from him and to establish a kingdom for Jonathan. Because he's saying, whilst Ben Yishai, David, is alive, you won't be king. So let's bring him here and kill him. Now, um, if he really felt that Jonathan wasn't his son, I don't think that's what he really thinks. I think that's what he, you know, I, I understand the, the explanation. It's a lovely explanation. But in his anger, that's what he was saying. You know, you, you can't possibly be my son. But he didn't really believe that. He was just saying that as, a, as a, an insult to Jonathan because he's so angry with him. But actually, he does want him to be the king. He does want his own offspring, i.e. Jonathan, to be the next king and not David, even though he's been told by Shmuel, hasn't he, at the, uh, at the episode of the torn coat. Remember when, when um, and Shaul grabs hold of Shmuel's coat and tears it and Shmuel turns around to him and says, yes, God has torn away the kingdom from you and given it to somebody else who's better than you. So Shaul is, is, is battling with reality here, he's, he's battling with, with what he knows to be the case, uh, because Shmuel has told him in the name of God, but he's not accepting of it, and he still wants Jonathan to be the next king. And so in verse 31, he retracts a little bit from verse 30, and says, despite the fact that you're an idiot, and you're shameful, um, and um, I'm very, very angry with you. Despite that, he still says, you need to be the next king. And the only way we can do that is to get rid of David because he is a threat. Um, so bring him to me, for he is a Ben Mavet. Ben Mavet who? He is a literally a son of death. He is condemned to death. And I think, Jeffrey, you said deserving of death. Um, he's he's uh, so now it's very obvious, isn't it? Jonathan, at the beginning of this chapter, remember. Um, or it was in the end of the last chapter, his father, Shaul, had sworn to him. By Hashem's name that he wouldn't kill David. Remember that? Let's see if we can find it. Yeah. I know he lost his temper, Johnny, but he still, he still insulted his own wife. <laughs> he insulted his wife. He insulted yeah. his son. He insulted yeah. David. He's lost the plot. He's really yeah. lost his temper here. Um, so where is it over here? I think uh, it must be in the previous chapter, mustn't it? Where um, Shaul said... Um, here we go. Verse six of chapter 19, please, uh, Jeffrey. Verse six on, on the screen as well. Saul listened to Jonathan's voice and Saul swore, as Hashem lives, he shall not die. So, so Jonathan... there you are. In verse six of chapter 19, Chai Hashem. That is a, an oath in God's name. One of the most serious things that you can do um, and Shaul swears by God's name that he's not going to put David to death which is why at the beginning of our chapter beginning of chapter 20 let's go back to that um, Jonathan says no 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 you're not going to die um, um, it's, it's, it, it, my father would have told me if that was the case why should my father conceal this thing from me verse 2 um, and David says in verse three, remember, don't be so naive, Jonathan. There is but a step between me and death. 
David says, no, you're wrong, Jonathan. Your father does want to do me in. And that's why they made this whole plan with the arrows and the, and the, the, the Macha Chodesh business. Um, and right up until the end, right up until the end of this chapter that we're doing at the moment, these verses here, Jonathan is still hoping that his father's oath in the name of God will prevent him from killing David. But he's just heard now that he is a Ben Mavet. So how can it be that Shaul swore in God's name that he would not put David to death? And now he's saying he is going to put him to death. Why? How, how does that work? How can it be? Well, it's the paranoia, isn't it? It's the schizophrenia. Okay. Does, Jonathan, does Jonathan not remind you of his father what he said about swearing to God? Doesn't look like it, does it? No, no. And I think the reason that that happens, and I think the reason that it's changed, is that Shaul now has an excuse to kill David. What's the excuse? He has rebelled against the king. The king has ordered him to be at this meal. And he's run off to Bethlehem. According to Jonathan, anyway, um, he has disobeyed the king. And if you interpret that as Mored Bamalchut, if you interpret that as somebody who has rebelled against the king, who has deliberately disobeyed the king, off with, his head. off with his head. Off with his head. Absolutely. Off with his head. Like Vashti. So, what do you say, Nate, Michael? It's like Vashti. Like Vashti, yes. Vashti is another example, yeah. Off with the head. Um, according to one explanation, anyway. According to other explanations, Vashti wasn't off with the head. But anyway, um, Murad Bamalchut, if you are a rebellion, rebel against the king, that is your fate. And so in some ways, uh, uh, Johnny, Jonathan hasn't got anything to say. Yeah. Um, when he made an oath that he wouldn't kill David, that was then. Since then, David has now done something which could be construed as being worthy of the death penalty. And that is what Shaul has said. He does, however, um, he does, however, Jonathan, try to uh, save the situation. Verse 32, Jeffrey. But Jonathan spoke up to his father Saul and said to him, why should he die? What has he done? OK, stop there. So that was brave of Jonathan, really. He knows his father's in the foulest of moods. Um, he's just been told that he's not fit to be a son of Shaul's. He's just been told that he's the most shameful, rebellious punishment worthy son that anybody could possibly have and despite that he stands up to him and he says why are you putting him to death what's he done in other words he's saying well no i don't think he has been murdered by malchut he's not rebelliously uh, disobeyed the king i told you what happened he asked me for permission and i said he could go why do you want to put him to death and Shaul doesn't even answer. Well, he does answer, but he answers with action rather than with words. Verse 33. Saul, Saul hurled his spear at him to strike him. Jonathan then realised that his father had decided to kill David. Jonathan Stop there. Rose. Stop there. So, yeah, that's his answer. Shaul doesn't even answer him. He, he, he throws his spear at him. Uh, as we said last week, it, thankfully, he's not a very good shot. As he's missed David twice, and now he's missed Jonathan. Uh, but he's not stable. He's, he's clearly um, not well, mentally ill, paranoid, uh, violent. Um, and he tries to cast the spear to strike Jonathan. And then... At that point, Steinsal said he didn't intend to kill Jonathan, just like he smashed it down. The tech, you know, smashed it down. That's what I, don't, it says. I don't know how he can say that 
uh, actually, Johnny. If you look at the Hebrew words and in the English yeah. translation, Vayatel Shaul etachanit alav, he threw the spear at him, lehakoto, in order to strike him. As an expression of his anger, although he did not intend to kill Jonathan, that's added by Rabbi Stanzel. So. Mm, I'm, I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced. Uh, I don't think that's what the I don't think that's what the uh, the pasuk is saying here. The, 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 the simple pshat of the pasuk is that lahakoto to strike him. Um, that is an, an expression of death. Yeah. Where do we have that expression meaning death? Makat bechorot. Makat bechorot. Yes, Barbara. Makat bechorot. The striking of the firstborn. It's the same word, la um, hakoto. So the the uh, it, it's that expression, la hakoto, means to kill him. Um, and so he, I, I, I would, I would question Rav Steinsaltz's explanation there um, that he didn't want to kill him. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. Uh, but the pasuk is telling us that he at that point. Um, his intention was la hakoto to strike him, and if your intention is to strike somebody with a spear, um, then um, yes, yes, Jeffrey. Is this where the, um, the, the I don't know what you call it, Bobby Meiser or whatnot? People going with sugar at Rosh Chodesh, the new moon um, makes them go with sugar. Is this uh, where it could come from? Um, Okay, interesting question. First of all, let's just say hello to Peter. Welcome to Peter. Nice, nice to see you. Um, let's. Uh, so Jeffrey says, "Is this where you get people went with sugar?" No, they went with sugar at the full moon, Jeffrey, not at the new moon. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, some kind of uh, there was a, 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 a an illness called porphyria, um, which traditionally uh, um, they, they were going with sugar at the new moon. I think King George the Third if I'm not mistaken, was uh, a sufferer of this. Uh, and he went with sugar at the, at the full moon. Uh, so um, uh, Shaul goes with sugar when he has this, when he has this ruach ra'ah from Hashem on him. He, he, he has these, these episodes of paranoid schizophrenia. Um, and he's clearly also got a, a wicked temper on him. Um, we can see that. And, and you can see throughout this whole story um, that the the um, the Tanakh, the author of, of Shmuel Aleph, which is said to be Shmuel himself, um, is not writing in a pleasant way about Shaul. He's very critical of Shaul's behavior. You can see that the hero of this entire story is Jonathan. Um, he is the one who is utterly torn between his loyalties to his father and his love for his friend Jonathan um, David, um, he's in a terrible situation here because he is um, uh, is piggy in the middle between uh, his uh, friend David, his uh, um, somebody to whom he's pledged his soul, and his father. Uh, he knows that his father is acting wrongly. He knows his father is acting irrationally, and yet. Somehow or other, he still has that loyalty to him. He has a, uh, um, an obligation to his father. So um, Saul casts a spear to strike him. And at that point, Jonathan knows the game is up. Up until then, he's still trying to change his father's mind. In verse 32, he says, why should he be put to death? He challenges his father. His father then throws the spear at him and the Tanakh says, it's over. It was over. What was, where's the word chala? What, where do you see, where's the root of that word? And what does it mean? In our translation, it says it has been decided. Um, what, what have you got, Jeffrey? Um, Verse 33. Saul hurled Saul his spear at him to strike him. Jonathan then realized 
that his father had decided to kill David. Okay, so it's the same word, decided. Ki chalahi. But that's not the, the, um, the literal translation of the uh, word chala. Uh, anybody know what the root of that word is, chala? You will have said it. Um, hmm. You would have said it in the last 36 hours at least three times. What is the root of that word, chala? Give me a... chala. No, that's boi kala. That's a kala, uh, as in a bride. A bride. Yeah. But you're in the right. You're in the right. You're in the right category there. You're in the right sort of time frame. <laughs> Anything to do with bread? Uh, no, not to do with bread. That's with a chet. This is with a chaf. Okay. Close to close to um, boi kala. Where is it from? Anyone? Okay. Peter, if you're speaking to us, you're muted. We can't hear you. Unmute yourself. There you go. Yeah, Kabbalah uh, Chabad. Yeah, where, where, is, where is that the root of that word chala? What do we say in Kabbalah Shabbat, which is the root of that word chala? Um, I'll give you another clue. We say it uh, when we get home on Friday night after Kabbalat Shabbat. I'll give you another clue. We have a cup of wine in our hands when we say it. Yeah. Kiddush. Kiddush. Vayachulu. Vayachulu. Vayachulu hashamayim v'ha'aretz. What does that mean? Vayachulu hashamayim v'ha'aretz. What's the translation of that? And he finished the heavens and the earth. And it, yeah, he finished the heavens and well, that literally yeah. means they were finished. The heavens and earth yeah. were finished. Yeah. So this word chala means finished, as in vayachulu. So here, the, the translation in the art scroll and the translation on our screen had been decided is a colloquial translation. Um, uh, but the, the Hebrew word gives it a much more final sort of uh, finished, uh, final um, feeling to it. Vayeda Yehonatan, Yonatan knew ki chalahi me'im aviv, that it was over, it was finished from his father. In other words, his father had decided. But the Hebrew word here is a much more, what's the Hebrew word for to de decide? Gachlit. Lahachlit which is with yeah. a chet and a, yeah. and a tet, not anything to do with our word chala. Here it means finished. Here it, it was over. Vayeda Yehonatan, if I was translating this, I would have written Vayeda Yehonatan, Jonathan knew ki chala imaviv, that it was over as far as his father was concerned. Lahamit et David, he was going to kill David. It was Steins out says it was settled. Steins out says what? It was settled. Settled. Okay, that's that's yeah, that's a good uh, expression. Although uh, settled doesn't to me doesn't give it the power. But yeah, it's finished. It's over. Done with. By ye, you know, if somebody chucks a spear at you. You know that he means business. So Jonathan is is thinking here, and he knows it's all over. It's finished. Um, um, where else do we have that word? I could be wrong on this, uh, but I think we have. Do we not have that word? Uh, I'm going to ask David Marks this because um, uh, he'll probably know. Uh, where are you, David? I can't see you. Do we have this word when uh, with Achashverosh and Haman um, when Esther says uh, uh, Haman Arasha, uh, he's the one that wants to kill us. Uh, do we not have that? Ki chal davar or chal davar. Something like that. Yeah, so I think it's in the in the Megillah in Megillah Tester when uh, uh, at the party, Haman uh, and the king and Esther at the party, and the king says, "Okay, Esther, tell me what it is you want." 
and she says, I just want not to be killed. There's somebody who wants to kill us. And Haman and Achashverosh says, Me who's ever, Eza who? Who is this person? And, and uh, uh, Esther says, Haman Arasha Hazer, this evil Haman. And then the, the, the Megillah says, uh, um, um, Achashverosh goes off into the garden in a temper, and Haman falls on, on, the, on uh, 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 Esther's feet. Ki or words to that effect. It's the same word because he knew <laughs> it was over. I'm pretty certain it's the same word. We'll have a look at it later on. Uh, maybe David can find it while we're... Uh, while yeah, we're you, you, you've actually got um, an, an earlier example which Redak quotes. Uh, if you look at Bereshit chapter 18, verse 21... Let's have a look at that. Hang on. Chapter 18, verse 21. Where are we talking about here? The destruction of Sodom and Amorah. Ah, there we go. Very good. Erdana, I will descend now, the era, and I will see Hakata Kata Bailai Asu Kala. Kala. I will see according to the cry which is coming in, what they have done. I will wreak destruction upon them. Yeah, Kala, finish. I'll finish off. Yes, excellent. Okay, great. So, um, there's our word. Let's go back to our our chapter now. Ki uh, It's all over. Jonathan knows it's all over. Um, and so, what happens? Verse thirty-four, Jeffrey. Jonathan arose from the table enraged. He did not partake of food on that second day of the month, for he was saddened over David. And because his father had humiliated him. Okay, stop there. So, Jonathan is very angry. Bachori af. That's a, an expression we see many times in the in the Torah. We often see vayichar af. Hashem, my God, became very angry. Uh, this is a, a an expression of anger. Jonathan is is very angry. Velo achal beyom achodesh asheni. Lechem, he lochal lechem. He didn't eat anything. Um, now it's very. It, we said it in the Shema this morning. God, uh, for when if, if uh, you bow down to idols, That's the right. Correct. We say it in the second paragraph of Shema. Well done. Yes. And this is interesting. Why are we being told <laughs> that he didn't eat anything? So why didn't he eat? So hello. Hello. So, what, who, who, would like, no, 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 who would like to suggest why we're being told that Jonathan did not eat on this day? He's lost his appetite because of his right. upset. He's so upset he's lost his appetite. I'll buy that. That's the simple reading of it. Um, you're right. He's so mad. We all know when we're upset, we lose our appetite. Appetite. I remember my grandmother of blessed memory, whenever she, she felt upset, she used to say, I can't eat, I'm pushing the food in, I'm pushing it in. Uh, uh, because, you know, she was too upset to eat. So, yeah, okay, I'll buy that. But there's something else. There's something else, I think, another reason why we're being told, and specifically, that he did not eat lechem. Why are we being told he didn't eat bread? specifically you have to know the next chapter to uh, answer this question uh, and as i said earlier on the next chapter is a story that we're not as familiar with um, so uh, let me ask you this question before we carry on anybody know the story of nov the city of nov does anybody know the story of the city of nov <coughs> David, are you familiar with the story of Nov? Uh, yeah, I've read ahead. Go on. Okay. So um, we will find in the city, in the story of the city of Nov, which is the next chapter, which we're going to come on to in a minute, we will find, I think, a reason why we are being told that Jonathan didn't eat bread. And I am not going to tell you what that is now. I'm going to hold you in suspense uh, until we get to chapter 21. And uh, then we'll come back and I'll ask you the question again. 
um, when we have learned chapter 21, or at least some of chapter 21. So for the moment, just have in your mind... It doesn't say bread. It says food. Well, again, uh, um, I, I'm, going, why, I'm going to um, ask you a question. Uh, Johnny Halpern, how do you say food in Hebrew? Uh, there are two words for food in Hebrew. Madane. Ochel. Ochel. Ma mazon. Ochel and mazon. And what does lechem mean? Mazon. Lechem is bread. Lechem is bread. So uh, again, I'm going to, it's not mm. often... Not often I'm going to take uh, take uh, issue with Rav Stein's out twice in a shiur, but there you are. Um, lechem is bread. Uh, and if you take the simple explanation that you said, Johnny, that he's so upset he can't eat, then you can translate lechem as, as, as food. He didn't eat anything yeah. because he lost his appetite, as you said. But I think there's a reason why the Tanakh uses the word lechem. And we will come to that in the story of Nov. And I'll ask you the question again. Uh, later on, maybe not later on today, maybe next week. But for the moment, he gets up, Jonathan gets up mad as hell, and he can't eat anything, and he's not eating any bread. Why? Kineetzav el David. We have on the screen the, the translation for he was grieved concerning David. I think Jeffrey said he was saddened about David. Um, the uh, modern Hebrew word comes from here. There's a modern Hebrew word, atzuv, which means sadness. If you are yeah, ani atzuv, means I'm it's sad. It. I am sad. Uh, atzuv is a is a uh, an adjective to say I am sad. Um, so Ned Savel David, he was sad. He was upset about David. Now, what is interesting is we have had this word before. In this chapter, who would like to find me this word, Ne'etzav, or the root of the same word, in this very chapter? I'll make it easy for you. I'll find it on the screen. Pasuk Gimel. There we are. Who said Pasuk Gimel? Must have been David. Yeah. Okay. Hey, uh, Jeffrey, read Pastor Gimel for us, verse 3 of our chapter. But David swore to him again and said, Your father knows very well I have found favour in your eyes. So he said to himself, Jonathan should not know about this, lest he be saddened. However, as Hashem lives, and by your life, there is but a footstep between me and death. So this was earlier on in the, in the story. David says to Jonathan in chapter, uh, in verse one, um, why is your father trying to kill me? And Jonathan says, no, he's not trying to kill you. If he was trying to kill you, I would know about it because he tells me everything. And what he doesn't say is, and also he's sworn to me that he's not going to kill you. He doesn't say that there. But anyway, he says, I would know about it. And David says to him in verse three, no, your father knows that we're mates. He knows that we're good friends and he doesn't want to upset you. He doesn't want to upset you. And that's why he's not told you, told you that he's going to kill me. But I'm telling you, by the life of your soul, there is but a step between me and death. He is after my blood. I'm telling you, Jonathan, your father is after my blood. And he hasn't told you because he doesn't want to upset you. There's that word, pen ye at save, unless he upset you. So now at the end of the chapter, as it were, uh, we are closing the circle. Um, Jonathan now knows. Uh, we've said in verse 33, Vayeda Yonatan. Yonatan knows ki chalahi. It's over. He knows that David wants, uh, John, uh, Shaul wants to kill David. And Taka, he was very upset about it. David was right in a way that had Shaul told him that he was going to kill David, he would be aggrieved. He would be at Suv. Because when David, when Jonathan did understand that Shaul wanted to kill David, that's exactly what he was. He was at Suv. 
So this expression here, where have we gone? Uh, that closes the circle from the beginning of the chapter, uh, it closes the circle in a literary sense. Uh, Jonathan now knows the score and he's very, very upset. Not only that, he's also upset because he's, despite the fact that he is the hero of this whole story and Jonathan uh, comes on to no criticism at all, at least not at this point, he's also a human being and his father has put him to shame. Remember, where has all this taken place? Not not in the inner chambers just between Jonathan and Saul. It's taken place at the Rosh Chodesh feast. It's taken place in front of everybody. All the courtiers. All the courtiers. We know some people are there. Well, we know that David's not there because they will notice that his place was missing. But we do know who else was there, don't we? We know Avner was there. Uh, Verse 25 tells us that Avner was there. And as Johnny said, you can imagine, this was a big deal. This was uh, um, the, the, the king's Rosh Chodesh party, full of the courtiers, full of the whole people. And in front of everybody, Shaul speaks in such a terrible, disparaging uh, uh, manner about Jonathan. And he's very upset by it. And I think that's ent he's entitled to be upset by it. Uh, so his father has put him to shame. He's upset about David and he's angry. Uh, his father has put him to shame. Last so now... He insulted his mother. He oh, and he insulted everybody. his mother as well. Yes. Yeah, that was yes, terrible. correct. He insulted his mother. And as we said last week, there is nothing more that a person hates than to have their mother insulted. Yeah. Which is why when you want to insult somebody, you call them the son of a bitch or whatever uh, you, expression you choose. Uh, you, 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 you insult them by insulting their mother. There's no more greater insult. You're right, Anita. I'd forgotten about that. It says so, he, he, he was humiliated. Humiliated, yes, that's a good word. Put him to shame, humiliated. Humiliated is a good word. It gives, it gives the impression of, of the severity of what's going on here. So it's very want, upset. Two one fish tank cells. Yeah. <laughs> 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 OK, uh, so so Jonathan is very angry. So now what's he got to do? Remember the beginning of the chapter, we had this whole performance that, that Jonathan says to David, I'll tell you what, I'll find out. We'll do this little test. You will not turn up for the Rosh Chodesh meal. And if my father says, oh, OK, that's no, no big deal. He'll come when he's ready. I will then send for you. And if it is a big deal and he wants to kill you, I will um, shoot these arrows. Remember, there was a story I was going to shoot three arrows. Let's just remind ourselves of what he said he was going to do. Um, and David said to Jonathan, verse 10, Jeffrey, please. Verse 10 of chapter 20. David then said to Jonathan, Who will tell me if your father answers favorably or if your father answers you harshly? So Jonathan said to David, Come, let's go out into the field. And they both went out to the field. Jonathan said to David, I swear by Hashem, the God of Israel, that I will probe my father at this time on the third day from now. And behold, if it is good for David, will I not send for you and reveal it to you? Stop there for a second. So he says initially, if it's good, I will send for you and tell you. OK, carry on. Verse 13. Such shall Hashem do to Jonathan, and such shall he do further. If it pleases my father to harm you, I will reveal it to you, and I will send you away, that you may go to peace, and may Hashem be with you, as he was with my father. 
So he says there, stop there, and he says there, if it turns out that when I probe my father, it turns out that he intends evil to you, in other words, he wants to kill you, I shall reveal it to you. The Galiti. I will reveal it to you. And I'd want to just <laughs> to show you the Hebrew here. The Galiti et Oznecha. I will reveal it to you. I will reveal it to your ears. Oznecha are your ears. I will reveal it to your ears. Now, the implication there is that I personally <clears throat> will come and tell you. Okay, carry on. Am I carrying on verse 14? Yes, please. <clears throat> I may go. I need not ask anything of you if I will still be alive when you become king. For would you not do with me the kindness of Hashem so that I will not die? So Jonathan says, I will tell you, and then I'm asking you for kindness. So that was the plan. Um, that he will go and find out what's going to happen. And he personally, Jonathan personally, will tell him what's going to happen. I shall reveal it to you. But then he changes his mind. Let's just go on to verse 18, please. Jonathan said to him, tomorrow is the new moon and you will be missed because your seat will be empty. For three days you are to remain far down and come to the place where you hid on the day of the incident and stay near the marker stone. I will shoot three arrows in that direction as if I were shooting at a target. Behold, I will then send the lad saying, go find the arrows. If I say to the lad, behold, the arrows are on this side of you, then you yourself may take the arrows and return. For it is well with you and there is no concern as Hashem lives. But if I say this to the boy, behold, the arrows are beyond you, then go, for this is a signal that Hashem has sent you away. Stop there. So now there's a different plan. He's not going to tell him himself. He's going to do this shooting of the arrows business as a sign, as a... Uh, uh, um, as a, 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 sim, a sign that David should either come out of hiding because it's safe or he should do a runner because it's not safe. So now uh, in our area, with part of the chapter now that we're up to, uh, in, chapter, in, in verse 34, Jonathan now knows the score. He knows that Saul means evil towards David. So now he has to go and put into effect the plan that he had before which was to shoot the arrows so interestingly he doesn't do it straight away now i wonder why that is he rose from the table in anger and he did not eat any food on the second day of the new moon verse 35 jeffrey it happened the next morning that Jonathan went out to the field for the meeting with David and a young attendant was with him. Stop he there. Said, Why did he wait till the next morning? Because of the third day. Yes. Well done, Jeffrey. And, and on the that screen. Was the arrangement. Yes. On the screen, the, 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 your translation didn't really do it justice, but the translation in the Chabad on the screen does. And it was in the morning that Jonathan went out at David's appointed time. OK, they had an appointment and it was on the third day. Now, look at the Hebrew word for this. Le Moed. What is a Moed? The time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but what is a Moed as well? An appointed time. An appointed fixed, time. Fixed, fixed time. A fixed time. And what do we do on a fixed time? Uh, we bench the new moon. We do. But we also do other things on a particular fixed time. Elem Oadei Hashem. Ah! Elem Oadei Hashem. What does that mean? These are the appointed times by God. 
And what is what you're talking about when you say a la moadi? When do you say that? On the chagim. On the chagim, exactly. So a moed is another word for the chagim. Uh, a moed, a la moade adonai, a shetikru otam, but moadam. These are the appointed times of Hashem that you will call out, burn mo adam at their appointed times. So the appointed time for Pesach is the 15th of Nisan. The appointed time for Shavuot is? Six of Sivan. No, 50 days, that's the wrong answer. It is, but it's the wrong answer. The fixed day <laughs> for Shavuot is 50 days after Pesach. Because the Torah does not tell us it's the 6th of Sivan. It's the only one of the Chagim that the Torah does not tell us the date of. Okay? So the fixed time for Shavuot is 50 days after Pesach. And the fixed time for Sukkot is the 15th of Tishrei. So uh, these Moadim are fixed times. And that's the same word here, Moed. And that's why this translation, say your translation again, Jeffrey, verse 35. It happened the next morning that Jonathan went out to the field for, for the meeting with David and a young attendant was with him. So it doesn't really give you the flavour that it was a fixed appointed time um, for the word Moed in the same way as we, our translation here. I think our translation is better. What does Steins out say, Johnny? At the time appointed with David. <clears throat> OK, so that's good. Um, so that's two all. Two all. <laughs> <laughs> Right, so I just wanted to point out that word Moed to you. So he goes out the next morning and he's got this boy with him. And verse 36, Jeffrey. Sorry, the jo Johnny. Yeah. Can I just pick up something on the word Moed as well? Yes, uh, please. As, as Johnny said, a fixed appointed time, uh, which includes as well in Parashat HaMoadim, uh, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And what's special about a Moed? as opposed to a Shabbat, that the Moed is fixed by man, whereas Shabbat is fixed by Hashem. So this was a Moed that was fixed by Yonatan and David, like the Moadim, which are fixed by Bet Din at appointed times and not like Shabbat. Excellent. OK, now, so you all understood that, I'm sure. Shabbat is fixed by Hashem because that was the seventh day after creation. By the way, that's a whole long story as well, whether Shabbat is every seventh day after creation or whether it's Shabbat is when we make it Shabbat. On the basis of what David has said, then Shabbat is made by Hashem, not when we make it. Um, but we've got some problems with that when we cross the international date line and all sorts of things. So it's not for now, it's for another time. Um, but for the Chagim, they are definitely uh, made by man. How do we know that they're to be made by man? Well, the Pasuk, which uh, Johnny started and I finished. Eile Moadei Adonai, Asher Tikra'u Otam. These are the festivals of Hashem, of fixed times of Hashem. Asher Tikra'u Otam, which you shall call out. Same word as Kore. Asher Tikra'u Otam. It's a, it's the, it's a, a, a second person, plural imperative tikra'u you shall call out not me says hashem i'm not making these fixed times you've got to fix them um that's and, and of course there's a very famous gemara where uh oh paul's not happy not happy with that paul the 15th of nissan is fixed in the torah isn't it yeah but we have to fix when the 15th of nissan is by saying when rosh Chodesh is oh uh, i see yeah yeah but hashem decides that by when you allow the new moon to come along no, we, we decide we, it when we decide who sees no, it. We decide when we see it. We have to have witnesses to see what Hashem has done. Yeah, but the, the, it's... It, the and, then, and, then, and then, as you say, Shabbat, it's fixed 50 days from then. And that's so, fixed by God. Okay, I, I'm not making this up, Paul. This is, uh, this is not my chidush. Asher tikru'u otam, the Mephoshim all say that the, the, the Moadim are fixed. And I was about to say... Uh, the proof of that is the famous um, Gemara, which we actually learned some time ago. I can't remember in what context that, where we went to it, but we definitely learned to it in one of our, one of our shiurim. The famous uh, Gemara where um, um, Rabbi Yeshua, I think it is, is told to come with his stick 
and his money uh, on the day that he says is Yom Kippur. And Rabban Gamliel says it's the day after, or the day before, I can't remember which. Um, and he's made to come on Yom Kippur that he thinks is Yom Kippur, um, and with his stick and his, and his uh, uh, money. And, and that's used as a proof that, that Sheti Kru'u Otam means that the Moadim, and on this occasion it was Yom Kippur, as David points out, it's also a Moed, um, that is something which is fixed by man, by the fact that we fix the day of Rosh Chodesh, as opposed to Shabbat. But it's not so simple even with Shabbat because of the international date line, etc. So um, that was Moed, yes. So thank you for pointing that out. Um, he has now got this small boy with him, Na'ar Katon. Uh, verse 36, Jeffrey. He said to his attendant, please run and find the arrows that I shoot. The attendant ran and he shot the arrow to go beyond him. Stop there. So that's the sign, isn't it? We just, we just rehearsed that sign earlier on, didn't we? The yeah. sign is, if he sends it uh, this side in front of where David is, then it's safe to come out. But if it goes beyond him, then he's got to do a runner. Okay, so he sends it beyond because he now knows that David's in danger. Verse 37. The attendant arrived at the place of the arrow that Jonathan had shot, and Jonathan called out after the attendant and said, is not the arrow beyond you? Stop there. So just in case David has not got the message from the fact that the arrow has been shot beyond him, he actually says to the boy, isn't the arrow beyond you? Yes, Paul. I've never understood this, because if they had a code, you'd think that's it. But they didn't. They didn't then they met each other afterwards. Ah, so why, exactly. why did they need the code? Exactly. I'm coming to that. That's, that's going to be the last five minutes of the shiur. Exactly. It's a very, very good question. The whole thing seems a bit irrelevant, doesn't it? Seems a bit pointless. Uh, we don't know that yet, though, because we haven't learned the next few psukim. So just hang on. OK, so he says, the arrow's beyond you. That's the sign. David, you need to do a runner. Verse 38. Jonathan then called out after the attendant. Quickly, hurry, do not stand still. Jonathan's attendant gathered the arrows and came to his master. OK, stop there. What is Jonathan saying to the, to the, um, the boy here? He's saying, hurry up. Go and get those arrows. What's he really saying? Go past David so he'll see that he, it's definitely gone past him. I think he's speaking to David. I, uh, think he, I think he's saying to David, hurry up. You know, time, of, time is of the essence. He's pretending to say to the boy, hurry up quickly. Don't stand around. What do you mean don't stand around? That he's, he's, it's a code to David to say, my father is after you and time is of the essence. I think this is a part of the code. Um, and then carry on. We'll come to Paul's question yes. very shortly. The attendant knew nothing. Only Jonathan and David understood the matter. Jonathan gave his equipment to his attendant and said to him, go, bring it to the city. Okay, stop there. So Jonathan gets the arrows back from the boy. And then at this point, the story should end because the sign has been given. David now knows that he has to run away. Jonathan has even said, don't hang about, get on with it, run away quickly. And that should be the end of the story. But it isn't. There's two more psukim here, which raise the question that Paul has asked. Let's read the psukim. And then we'll discuss the question. 41. The attendant went and David stood up from near the south side of, stone, of the stone and he fell on his face to the ground and prostrated himself three times. Each man kissed the other and they wept with one another until David wept greatly. Jonathan said to David, go to peace. What the two of us have sworn in the name of Hashem, saying, Hashem shall be a witness between me and you, and between my offspring and your offspring shall be forever. Stop there. And that's the end of the chapter. 
That's the end of the story. That's the end of the Haftorah. And largely, that's the end of our knowledge of this Sefer Shmuel up till now, because most of us never learned Tanakh. And so we only know the little bits and bobs that we know from the various Haftarot. So we end the story here. Um, and the boy goes away. They have this, this meeting. They kiss one another. Um, and they make this oath, and then um, that's the end of the story. But as Paul just asked, what was the point of all that arrow business? If, he, if they're going to meet anyway, they could have just said, I'll meet you here on the third morning at 10 o'clock, and I'll tell you what my father says. If he says it's okay, you will come back with me to town. And if um, it's not okay, then we'll take our leave of one another, and you'll go off. Uh, in your direction um, and they didn't need that whole arrow business so what's it all about so go on paul what's your uh, suggested answer he hasn't got an answer okay it's as i said it always puzzled me <laughs> okay well I, it puzzles me too um but i'll tell you what i think well let's see what everybody else thinks before you hear my rubbish um well anybody else uh, got a suggestion as to what why, why this whole thing this whole arrow business took place Anyone? All right, well, I'll tell you what I think. Um, right at the beginning, and I pointed this out to you a few minutes ago, uh, he said, Jonathan says, where is it again? Vagaliti um, la oznecha. I will, I will reveal it to your ears. Remember, right there it is. Vagaliti et oznecha. I will reveal it to you. And I said, that that was his original plan was that he personally would come and tell David. And then he had concocts this arrow business and then he does the arrow business. But in the end, I think he can't stop himself. I think Jonathan can't stop himself. His original plan was to speak to David himself. I promise you, David, I personally will come and tell you. And what he <coughs> hoped, of course, was it hoped against hope that the message would be a good message. Because right when he said that, he still got the knowledge of his father's oath that he's not going to kill David. He still got the knowledge or the feeling that his father would have told him if he had bad things to say about David. And so at the time he said, I will reveal it to you, he wants, he thinks that the, he's hoping the message is going to be a good one. Don't worry, David, I will come personally and tell you. If it turns out bad and you've really got to do a quick runner, we'll have this sign uh, that, that we have. But when it comes to push, comes to shove, and um, he has to take his leave of him, he can't do it. He can't take his leave of him by the, the, the arrow method. And um, look who institutes it, not Jonathan. Look at verse 41. Do it again for us, Jeffrey. The attendant went and David stood up from near the south. Stop. Near the south stop. side of the stone. Stop, 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 stop. The, the boy went away and immediately, immediately, David <laughs> arises. Not Jonathan. David institutes this meeting. David gets up from his hiding place as soon as the boy's gone and he, look who is more upset now. Is it David or is it Jonathan that's more upset? David. David's David. David. more upset. David's David, more upset. David, First of all, yeah. David gets up. David is the one that institutes the, the hug and the kiss. He mm. falls on his face the ground three times and in Ad David Higdil until David exceeded. Um, I'm not quite sure what this, this, uh, this expression means. Higdil means to become great, means from the word gadol, to become yeah. bigger. Um, uh, and David exceeded. So David's crying was greater even than Jonathan's. That's the implication from here. It's obviously quite an intense relationship, it would seem. Yes. Are you thinking what I'm thinking, Peter? Yes, of course I am, yeah. 
Okay, so uh, what, what you don't know is I mentioned this uh, last week, not this particular word, yes. but I mentioned last week that I had a few years ago given a shior on the homosexual relationship between David and Jonathan and the various yes. li linguistic uh, um, 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 hints to that. And, yes. and actually, this was one of them. Um, it was a good few years ago. And as I said last week, it wasn't altogether um, accepted. It was a bit shocking um, yeah. for the, the rather um, 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 conventional polegites. But um, they're, they're probably used to my uh, heresy a bit now and they might not be quite so shocked. But yeah, Ad David Higdil. Uh, it's potentially a, an expression of, uh, a, of, of a sexual nature here. Uh, there, that's one of the the, the uh, expressions. Yes, Jeffrey. I think it was an alleged uh, relationship, an, an alleged homosexual. There's no direct reference to homosexuality. It's just it, it it's alleged. It, it, it there's no evidence to support it. I think that's what your your sheer uh, concluded. My sheer concluded really concluded that it was rude. Correct. It, it right. was a, an allegation for which there were significant hints, but no proof. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So um, leaving that bit aside, um, it certainly is an intense relationship. But at this point, what's really interesting is that David himself is the one that uh, um, um, institutes this particular meeting. And uh, and so I think the answer to your question, Paul, is that the arrows was Jonathan's idea. And when push came to shove, David wasn't prepared just to run away without saying goodbye to David, uh, to, to Jonathan. David wasn't prepared uh, to do it. Uh, and his emotion overcame him. David exceeded. If we leave aside the, uh, the, 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 the discussion we've just had about, uh, about the uh, Higdil, it's clear here David is in a, in a very emotional state and he just can't take his leave of Jonathan without coming and giving him a hug. And, and they have this, this, this oath between them, this, this tremendous cool. oath between them. Uh, verse 42, Jonathan said to David, go in peace uh, and don't forget we have sworn uh, there, will be, uh, 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 there will be between you and me and being our descendants forever. And that's important. Jonathan is talking about his descendants because Jonathan knows that David's going to be king and kings take their revenge on their predecessors. So he's, he's reminding David that he has an oath here not to harm Jonathan and Jonathan's family. Now, uh, we're out of time, but I just want to do the first pasuk of the next chapter, because for me, um, and also actually for um, um, other Mephorashim in the, uh, in the, around, the chapter ends in the wrong place. Let's just look at the first pasuk of chapter 21. Uh, there it is on the screen for you. 22. Oh. Chapter 21. First, right. first uh, uh, pasuk of 21, Jeffrey. David in brackets arose and left, and Jonathan came back to the city. Stop there. That is where it should end. Jonathan uh, David arose and went away, and Jonathan went back to the city. That should be the end of chapter 20. It's the beginning of chapter 21, and I accept that it's also the beginning of chapter 21, but it's a funny place to end. I would have ended the chapter. Uh, I would have put this pasuk at the end of chapter 20, uh, the end of the story. And um, what we're going to read next time is the story of Nov. Um, and if you don't want a spoiler, don't read on. Uh, uh, we will uh, we will do the story of Nov. Uh, this story of David and Jonathan is not yet over, um, but for the time being, chapter 20 brings to a conclusion this intense relationship between David and Jonathan, um, which uh, ends with uh, Jonathan and David having to say goodbye because Shaul has called him a Ben Mavet. A, somebody who is uh, uh, condemned to death. Uh, and we'll see in the next coming stories that Shaul tries to fulfill his word. Yes, Jeffrey. I, I'm just intrigued by the last sentence of verse 42, which says, what the two of us have sworn in the name of Hashem, saying, 
Hashem shall bear witness between me and you, and between my offspring and your offspring shall be forever. Now, the, 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 their offsprings, David's offspring and, and Jonathan's offspring, are cousins. Yes, correct. Correct. David's offspring from his wife, Michal, who was right. Yonatan, Yonatan's sister. Yes. Correct. <laughs> Correct. J David and Jonathan are brothers in brothers in law, aren't they? Yes. yes. So, uh, okay. So uh, I, that makes the oath, I think, even more poignant, really, because he shouldn't have to make this oath, should he? I don't need to make an oath to say that my family and your family, Jeffrey, will be look after one another whenever there's a problem. We don't have to say that because we're cousins and we know that. Here, David, despite Jonathan, despite that, the fact that their offspring are cousins, feels the need to invoke this oath. And the reason he feels the need to invoke this oath is because of what we said, that there is a rift in the family. Shaul is trying to kill David. David is going to become king. David is then entitled according to historical precedent entitled to take his revenge on Saul, Shaul and his family and Jonathan mm. is reminding David that he's made an oath that he won't do that okay can I ask you Johnny please yes yeah. in the passage 41 uh, they said they kissed each other and each and each wept with the other but and David more so then Rabbi Steinsaus adds but David knew that from then on, he was doomed to a life of hardship, persecution, and suffering. And that. Um, he knew that he was... Does it, Jonathan loved David, no less than David loved Jonathan. But David knew that from then on, he was doomed to a life of hardship, persecution, and suffering. So that's why he was more upset. Jonathan was going back to the palace. David was going on the run. So I think what Rav Steinsatz is saying is that in some ways David was more upset than Jonathan because he, he had a tough time coming. Yeah. Um, he was going to have to run off and hide and, and, and the whole king's army was going to be after him. Uh, and he did have a tough time. We'll read in the next uh, chapter yeah. that he had a, a tough time. Um, so I think what, what, what Rav Steinsatz is doing there is explaining why David appeared to be more upset than Jonathan. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Any other questions before we uh, call it a day for today? Thank okay. you very much. Great. Shabbat shabbat shabbat. Tov, everyone. See you shabbat next shabbat. time. Ta-da. Bye. Bye, Johnny.